Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. If you're watching this on the day of its public release, then I want to wish you a happy St. Patrick's Day. And with it being the holiday of St. Patrick's Day, I figured today would be a great day to read some true St. Patrick's Day horror stories. So, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. This happened on St. Patrick's Day in 2008, about a month after I got my driver's license. My buddy Eric and I had nothing to do, so we decided to cruise around the pike, a long stretch of highway surrounded by bars, strip clubs, restaurants, and general scenery, and enjoy the fact that I could finally drive at night. Prior to driving down the pike, we stopped at a convenience store to get some grub. As we were about to eat the food in my car, an older, very thin black woman approached my vehicle being an anxiety-stricken teenager with not-so-fast reflexes, I did nothing. She tapped on the window, which I rolled down just a crack. I noticed she had a horrible lazy eye. I've got a lazy eye too, but her one eye was just darting off in a hundred different directions and was dressed somewhat promiscuously. She was a twig though, so even her tight fishnet stockings were loose on her barebone legs. She looked at me with the normal eye and asked if I could give her a ride to the liquor store a couple of miles down the pike. I should make it clear that if this were to happen today, I wouldn't have made the mistake of letting her in the car. But I was a dumb kid, and so that's exactly what I did. Eric got out of the passenger side and sat behind it instead. He later explained that he did this so that if she tried anything funny, he could attack her from behind. And the woman got in and sat beside me. She kept thanking me, making an effort to constantly point out how sweet we were for doing this. As we drove down the pike, she started asking us questions. It started off as small talk. Where are you guys from? How old are you? What are you doing driving around on St. Patty's Day? And eventually, she asked if we were looking to party. We assured her that we were not looking to party, and she smiled and said, oh no no, two good looking boys like yourselves must be trying to party tonight. Still, I continued telling her that we were just trying to have a calm and normal night soon she mentioned that a friend of hers had just gotten off of work and asked if we liked hispanic women which was a very what the f out of the blue question i told her i uh didn't mind hispanic women i suppose and she smiled good good she's looking to party tonight too i don't know why it took me that long to figure it out but it was about that time that the unnerving thought popped into my head dude i think you just picked up an effing hooker if that was true, then I had already broken the law. So a bit of me went into panic mode as she proceeded to ask us more questions. She asked us if we drank, and then immediately reminded me that I was taking her to the liquor store. Not very subtle. Before long, we finally reached the liquor store. Finally. And as I pulled in, I noticed that the parking lot was completely empty except for a pickup truck. A man was seated in the driver's side seat of the truck, and upon seeing us, he turned his car and drove around me blocking the exit. My first thought was, oh God, it's an effing ambush. The man stepped out of his vehicle and began yelling at me. I rolled down the window to hear what he was saying and heard, she's bad news, man. Without hesitation, I turned the car off, grabbed the keys and leapt out of the car, not even shutting the door behind me. What do you mean? I asked him. That woman in your car is a prostitute, he told me, confirming my earlier suspicions. She walks around that Wawa back there and asks men to drive her to buy booze and then to the motel about a mile down the road. She's bad news, man. Relieved that this guy was evidently on my side, I let out a massive sigh of relief and begged him to help me. Again, I was a stupid teenager, and I had absolutely no idea what the hell to do. Back at my car, the lazy-eyed woman of the evening stuck her head out of the open door and asked if anything was wrong. The guy from the pickup truck angrily yelled, Get out of the car, now. She didn't listen. I could hear her muttering. It's all right. They're cool. It's all cool. My savior in the pickup marched over to the car and swung open her door. 
He growled for her to get out once more and didn't even wait for a response. He grabbed the chick and pulled her out, shoving her away. The entire time, she just kept mumbling, nah, nah, everything's all right. They said they're cool with it. As my friend stepped out of the back seat and hopped into the front seat, slamming and locking the door behind him, the guy yelled at her once more and she vanished behind the liquor store. I thanked him about a dozen times and he warned me to never pick up strangers again shortly before driving off. I hopped back in the car and sped away, nerves shot to oblivion. And today, I refuse to go near that effing Wawa, especially around March. Before getting into this next story, I do want to preface it with a couple of things. First of all, this story is very long, and when reading it, I almost didn't put it into this video because it seemed almost a little bit too unbelievable. However, a mod from the Reddit group did leave a comment on this post that said that OP has provided enough evidence to the mods that we are confident the events depicted in their submission probably did happen. So OP was able to provide evidence to the mods of this subreddit proving that this story is true. Also, I want to mention that St. Patrick's Day is only mentioned in one part of this story, but I still felt like it would count for this video. I hope you enjoy this story. Get ready for a roller coaster ride. Hey everyone. This is my first post of an actual story on Reddit, so bear with me. I've been reading everyone's amazing stories for years and felt like it was only fair that I contribute something back. Allow me to tell you about the time I dated a guy on MySpace for two years that nearly ended up getting my entire family murdered, me stalked by a psycho, and everyone involved nearly losing their minds. I've never written this down before or told very many people that I even trust. It's all just too painful and quite honestly unbelievable to tell often. If it didn't happen to me, I probably wouldn't believe it either. But unfortunately it did. I promise, what you are about to read is 100% the truth. I hope you all find this interesting. Let me give you some background info for this story. I'm an almost 28-year-old gay male who was born and raised in the Appalachian Mountains, which, for my friends, not in the Americas, that's in the South, more towards the Mid-Atlantic region. I usually don't just throw out being gay out there, but it's important to my tale and to understanding why I made such insanely poor choices in my teenage years. I know almost everyone does, but this really takes the cake. Follow me back to when I was 16, just about 12 years ago. I was a junior in high school, had plenty of friends and no trouble with bullies, at least not while I was at school. My parents are now wonderful people who greatly regret the way they treated me when they found out that I was gay. At the time, I hated them for being so horrendous to me. But as I got older, I finally understood that their reaction was just a product of the strict religious movement that they and myself were brought up in. Mild disclaimer, I do not have any hatred in my heart for any religion, no matter what its views are. Whatever you choose to believe is all right by me. I'm more of a treat people the way you'd like to be treated kind of guy. This just happened to me and my parents' reaction, so don't judge them too harshly. Also, I don't want the comments to turn into a religious debate and or LGBT rights discussion. This post is about none of that. It just so happened to be my circumstances. My parents, who at the time firmly believed that this would send my eternal soul into damnation, pretty much only allowed me to stay at our house a couple days a week after that. For at least a year, I was living on friends' couches and off the kindness of their parents. I was in what I can only describe as the worst state of miserable major depression I have ever been in in my entire life. I had tried to unalive myself the year before with a very serious overdose that cost me nine days in the ICU. I should have died, but your liver is an amazing thing and it started to regenerate on its own. A year to the day after that, literally to the day, the first guy I ever fell in love with was killed in a tragic car accident. My parents had zero sympathy for my feelings. They were the immoral feelings of their blasphemous son, so they didn't count, I guess. 
I remember coming back home from his funeral that night and my father asking me, why are you so upset? Were you a slur with that boy or something? I didn't even respond. Just walked right past him and straight into my room where I proceeded to cry myself to sleep. Again, don't judge them too harshly. They were different people back then. Needless to say, this sent me completely spiraling downward in the worst ways possible. Drugs, alcohol, you name it, I did it. Anything to stay numb and keep myself from feeling the immense amounts of pain I was in emotionally every single day. To have your situation go from a year before seeing your father cry for the first time as you lay dying in a hospital bed to him spewing so much malice and hatred towards you. Let's just say it was enough to make anyone have a mental breakdown. I had friends who cared about and loved me deeply. I don't know why that wasn't enough. It just wasn't. I felt like no one truly loved me or ever would. Hell, if my own parents couldn't, then what were my chances of finding a soulmate? Would I just be alone forever and as miserable as I was then? At the time, and in my angsty teen mind, that's exactly what it felt like. Which finally brings us through my background and mindset leading into the pure, unadulterated hell that was soon to follow. In the midst of my deepest, darkest despair, the brightest idea anyone has ever had on this planet popped into my head. Well, if no one around here will ever love me, then I'll just go online and try to meet someone who will. Pure stroke of genius, right? It just made absolute biblical sense to me at the time. I felt like the only gay teen in the whole damn state. Like the only person who really understood me was me. And only ever would be me. That in order to find someone to love, I would have to search far and wide beyond the borders of the mountainous fortress I had resided in my entire life. Proud of myself for having such an ingenious idea, I immediately hopped on MySpace. Facebook for us old people. For all you young folks saying WTF is MySpace. And spent the next hour making it as cool looking as I possibly could. You could customize just about everything on your profile. So of course mine had to accurately reflect all of my emo feelings and the darkness in my soul. Word to the wise and something I wish I realized back then. If you're trying to attract the darker things in society, you're probably going to get back exactly what you're sending out. I know I sure as hell did. It all started out innocently enough. I clicked on one of my gay acquaintances profiles. And for some reason, this guy on his top eight just flew right out at me. His name was Jacob. He was gorgeous, dressed in all black. And that was pretty much all I needed to know at the time. I saw he was from Maryland, several hours away from me, but far enough to possibly not be like everyone else here. Far enough to hopefully have exactly the kind of mentality that I was looking for in another human being. So I sent him a message, something lame to the effect of, hi, what's up? I saw you on my friend's top eight and thought you were cute, so I figured I'd say hello. I wasn't expecting a response. None whatsoever. He was so gorgeous and seemed way too cool for me. So why in God's name would he message a guy like me back? And then it happened. Within a minute of me sending my message, I got one back. And it was from him. Not gonna lie, I exploded in joy on the inside. Something that I hadn't felt in years and years. It was just something like... Hey, you're cute too. How old are you? But it was enough to send me all over the moon. I felt alive again. But what I really felt was hope again. We talked the rest of the day and night. We talked about each other. How much life sucked. How bad we wanted away from our hometown and our lives. You know, the usual for teen gay boys living in repression. I fell for him hard. Too hard. I mean hook, line, and sinker hard. We chatted for maybe a week before he asked me out. I had no problem with dating online. Hell, that was the whole point of me doing this in the first place. So I eagerly said yes. We had only been dating for a week after that or so, when he introduced me to the rest of his friends. I met his ex-boyfriend Zachary and their best friend Josie, who I quickly became best friends with, along with about 10 other girls and guys. Josie was a cool chick, and she had known these guys for years. Who better to give me all the dirt on them? During the course of the next month, Josie and I became the closest friends out of everyone he introduced me to, and what turned out to be a gang. They were mostly just a group of suburban white kids who called themselves the elites, and just drank and smoked a lot of weed. 
I had heard some crazy stories here and there about them beating people up, and some of them taking the gang thing way too seriously, but I didn't really think much of it. Josie and I had been talking on the phone every single day, and really made a genuine connection with each other. She had my sense of bizarre humor, was extremely intelligent, and still liked to have a crazy good time on top of it all. During this period, Jacob and I were doing great, but there was one little problem. I had started to fall in love with his ex, Zachary, the more I talked to him. Jacob could be intense and at times violent when he was angry, from what I had heard. But on the other hand, Zachary was his complete opposite. He was too kind for his own good, an extremely caring guy, and he wrote the most beautiful piano music I had ever heard. Being a musician myself, French horn for 10 years, I was immediately endeared to this guy. The more and more time I spent online talking to Zachary, the less and less time I felt like talking to Jacob. Eventually, Jacob kind of figured out what was going on, and to my shock, he let me know he was cool with it and was just the best. That's how, after about two months with Jacob, I started dating his ex, Zachary. This would be the guy I would date for the next two years and with whom the worst times of my life would be spent. Josie was clearly thrilled for me. We still talked every day online and on the phone. Sometimes I talked to Zachary on the phone, but more often than not, we just kept our communication to AOL Instant Messenger. When we started dating was when everything started to collapse. Jacob, who initially said he was okay with everything, ended up exploding. He completely tore me a new one online and then proceeded to go and kidnap my current boyfriend. Josie called me up, freaking me the hell out, saying that he'd taken Zachary and no one knew where they were. This clearly sent me reeling from shock. I guess all the rumors I had heard about Jacob were true, and now, because of my actions, the guy I'm in love with is in danger. I quickly contacted some of the older guys in the gang and let them know what was going on. Their response was basically, "Aw, crap, not again, which caught me off guard. Again? You mean this happens frequently? I talked to Chaz, the leader of this gang, while he sent some guys out to deal with Jacob and retrieve my boyfriend. He basically told me in a nutshell that Jacob has been and always will be obsessed with Zachary. That's when he gets wasted on whatever, goes cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, and sets out on some wild mission to kidnap and apparently violate my new boyfriend. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was in complete and total shock but apparently this situation was resolved easily, and he handed over my man without too much incident. He also received a healthy beating to remind Jacob that it's not nice to go around kidnapping people just because you can. This was the first, and certainly not the last incident I can remember, where a pattern I'm all too familiar with now would develop over the next several years. Jacob would get drunk and jealous. He would do something completely insane to me or my boyfriend, and then after all the freaking out and worrying was over with, he would come crying back to me, begging mine and Zachary's forgiveness. This became a weekly routine, and it began to wear me out mentally very quickly. Flash forward to around a year after I had sent the very first message to Jacob. I was still with Zachary, still best friends with Josie, who I had even been up to Maryland and met in person at this point, unfortunately to miss my boyfriend who was out of town visiting family, and was still dealing with Jacob's craptastic, insane plots to ruin my relationship and give me a stroke before the age of 20. None of this craziness set off any red flags in my head. Not one. As a matter of fact, nothing during that entire year gave me second thoughts about anything going on really. That day-to-day, the sky is falling lifestyle had become the norm for me and I was used to it. Several of my friends, however, had their doubts, though they were polite enough to keep them to themselves for the time being. This was when the first true danger that threatened me and my family ever arose, and it led to a night that I will never forget as long as I live. Cut to me as a 17-year-old, who in the span of one year had accomplished everything he set out to do. I had the perfect boyfriend. Even if I'd never met him, I didn't care. I had an awesome new best friend in Josie. We'd hung out a few times at that point, and I adored her. And I had joined a group of my own in my hometown. My parents were going to throw me away just because of who I loved. Well, then I was going to throw away every single religious thing I had ever been taught and go to the dark side. I became a Luciferian, otherwise known as a Satanist. And boy, oh boy, did I think I was a bad A now. 
Now, when it comes to the coven I joined in my hometown that could fill an entirely different story in an entirely different subreddit, maybe I'll post that experience sometime. But the point of telling you about them was so you could understand what happened next. I received a call one night around 12 a.m. from Josie, who was almost beside herself. Very out of character for her. I mean, hell, Zachary had been kidnapped over 40 times in the past year and she hardly batted an eye. But this was different. She explained to me that Jacob had really outdone himself and lost his mind this time. He had hired a guy from the elites named Sean to come down to my house and kill me, plus my mother, father, and younger sister. My sister is about seven and a half years younger than me, and from the day she was born, I have always been fiercely protective over her. She was, and still is, my beautiful baby sister, and truly the only one in my household that I loved at that time. When I heard that my ex had taken it so far as to hire a hitman to come after my family, I flew into what we around here call a mountain rage. It didn't matter to me if someone simply came after me, but to target my precious sister who had done nothing to do with any of this was the boiling point for me. And even though I despised my parents at the time, I'm still a southerner. And when you mess with a southerner's family, then all the crap you're fighting about goes right out the window complete and total defend the homestead mode kicked in. I asked Jody when he left Maryland. She told me she found out that he'd started driving towards my house maybe an hour ago. And as soon as she found out, she called me immediately. Okay, so that meant I had at the most six hours to prepare, and at least possibly four if he got a good head start. She also informed me that Sean was a former army guy, but got kicked out for failing several psych tests and being a complete sociopath in general. I'm not a big guy, and at the time I weighed even less than I do now. I was five foot seven and maybe weighed 130 pounds soaking wet, but my first thought didn't require brute strength to beat back this attacker. I called up my coven leader, Brandon, who lived not even 10 minutes away from me and explained the situation. I told him I needed to borrow his favorite toy, and I promised to bring it back in good condition with as little blood on it as possible. He agreed. About 30 minutes later, I was back home in my room, cleaning and loading an extremely nice over and under pump action shotgun. Like I said, no brute force required. I called Josie back up and got the details on exactly what he and his car looked like. Then around 4 a.m., I told her I would call her back and crept out into my front yard. Now for people who had never been to my house, they always got where to park at wrong. They always ended up in front of my house down a hill instead of in the driveway on the side. This little detail was stuck in my mind and probably saved my life. In the very front of my yard, there was a huge oak tree that was big enough for my skinny, girl jean wearing emo butt to hide perfectly behind. All I had to do was wait and hope he did exactly what I thought he would do. I got so lucky. He parked exactly on the opposite side of the big tree I was hiding behind. I heard a car door open and someone step out of the vehicle, shortly followed by the unmistakable cocking of a 9mm handgun. While that sound may have struck fear in the hearts of others, it absolutely enraged me to the core, so I replied in kind with a sound of my own. As I stepped around the side of the tree, he was directly in front of his car, gunned down by his side. In one motion, I simultaneously pumped a shell into the chamber of my shotgun and raised it directly level with his head about 10 feet away from me. This caught him off guard and completely by surprise. I didn't hesitate. I simply told him the God's honest truth. I said, buddy, you've got one of two options right now. Either you get back in your car, turn around, and drive straight back to Maryland without stopping, or you can so much as flint in my general direction, and I will spatter your brains all across the great state of, insert my state name. You have five seconds to decide, what's it going to be? I kid you not, the most sickly smile spreads across this psycho's face, and for a moment, I thought we were about to reenact the movie Tombstone. Fortunately, he had much more of a sense of self-preservation than I thought someone who just drove eight hours to kill a family he never met would have. All he did was give a little chuckle and said, You're a cool dude. See you around. He then walked off backwards very slowly, my gun following him the entire way, got back into his car and just drove off. Right then and there I made up my mind. I had to tackle the beast head on. I was always raised that if you have a problem, be a man and take care of it yourself. 
I had to go to my enemy Jacob's home turf and bring this war to his doorstep, just like he brought it to mine. It was time to go to Maryland. After all the drama of being nearly murdered by a nut job, I'd really had enough of Jacob's BS at this point. I got online and cussed him out until a fly wouldn't land on him, making a point to let him know that his little plan backfired. He wasn't dealing with some poor little boy that couldn't fight for himself. And each and every crazy situation that evolved had made me a stronger person, if not a little bit more mentally disturbed every time. I told him he was going to regret the day he ever crossed me and my boyfriend. Instead of apologizing like usual, his true callers finally came out. He laughed at me. He freaking laughed at me. He told me I was cute when I was angry and said what a damn shame it was that I didn't have a bullet hole in my head. He wished I was dead and that he never spoke to me in the first place because he was still in love, more like insanely obsessed with his ex, my current boyfriend of a year, Zachary. He informed me that the war was just beginning and he would do everything in his power to win Zachary back like he was some kind of adorable trophy you won for baking the best freaking pie at the county fair. I was incensed, completely livid and brimming to the edge with fury. I told him to watch his back because I'm coming for him. I called Josie and told her everything that happened and asked if I could come stay with her for a week. She excitedly agreed. Zachary was asleep for this whole ordeal and blissfully unaware that anything had happened. When he found out the next day, I think he was even more angry than I was. Fortunately for us, the gang's leader Chaz liked Zachary a whole hell of a lot more than he liked Jacob. So, we hatched a plan with him. The idea was for them to kidnap Jacob, like he had Zachary so many times before. They would be accomplishing this task while I was on my way up to Maryland, and when I got there, he would be mine to do with as I pleased. You can imagine on the eight-hour drive up there, all the hideous and heinously brutal ideas that were going through my head. I was going to inflict maximum amounts of pain on this guy that had caused me so much pain in my own life, and I would relish every second of it. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, my dreams of reviving the Spanish Inquisition on my ex's head never came to fruition. When I arrived in Maryland, Josie came skipping out to greet me, happy as a lark like always to see me. She had some good and bad news. I always asked for the bad news first, and the bad news was that Jacob had gotten tipped off by Kenny. God, I freaking loathed that guy, always meddling where he didn't belong, that everyone was coming for him. He made a hasty retreat and had intended to kidnap Zachary and take him on the run too. But that was the good news. Before he could get to him, Zachary had hopped on a bus and headed to New York to stay with his mom while things cooled off. As sad as I was that once again I had missed seeing him for the first time, I was just relieved that he was out of harm's way, safe and sound. Again, no alarm bells going off that for the second time that I had made the trip out there, Zachary was not around. Josie called him on her cell, and he apparently picked up his mom's, because he never had his own cell phone, and we got to enjoy one of the rare times we actually spoke on the phone. All was well. Now, for a week of fun and plotting on what we were going to do to Jacob the next time he reared his ugly head. Later on that week, Josie wanted to drive down to an old colonial part of Maryland and go ghost hunting on these abandoned railroad tracks. However, uneventful that may have been, we did end up inviting Sean to go with us. Turns out Psycho Dude actually felt bad. Well, almost. He blankly told me that if I didn't have the balls to stand up to him, he would have killed me and my whole family for just $500. Instead of killing him on the spot, which every fiber in my being was telling me to do, I decided to play nice and get him on my side. That way if Jacob ever tried that crap again, he would definitely tell him no because I'm the cool dude. Sometimes you catch more flies with honey. Anyways, the rest of the week was normal and a dang good time. Josie and I said our goodbyes and we parted ways wishing each other a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. The next couple of weeks was semi-normal. No word from Jacob at all. Not even a peep. What a gift, I thought. I'll take it. Year two of my relationship began quite happily, believe it or not. Even my birthday month of January was an unusually good one. Then came the next couple of months two months which quite vividly live within me to this day. They also define my life for the next several years. This is when the sky stopped falling and my world completely crumbled from beneath me into utter devastation. 
At the beginning of February, Josie had a sudden and urgent impulse to get away from her parents. Now, I could completely understand that, so I happily agreed to let her come stay down south with me. I borrowed my best friend's car and drove a 15 to 16 some odd hour round trip all the way to Maryland and back. My parents were less than thrilled. They told me she couldn't live in the house with us, so I said fine and shelled out my own money to a local La Quinta Inn where she and I lived for almost two weeks before my parents caved and let us back in my house. Now, I forgot to mention something extremely important earlier about my boyfriend, Zachary. He was very sick. I mean terminally ill, but we thought it wouldn't be for years. I was told he had cystic fibrosis, and he needed a double lung transplant in order to live much longer. He was hospitalized in the beginning of February, and rushed up the transplant list because his condition was so grave. I can't even begin to tell you how after the year we'd been through together, how badly I wanted to be by his side. Unfortunately, he was at a hospital in a part of the country that specializes in treating CF and was way too far for me to travel. Josie kept me in pretty good spirits about the whole thing. She had a lot of experience with cystic fibrosis since her sister died from it several years earlier. She reassured me that since he was so young and tried to take such good care of himself, that he would probably receive donor lungs very soon and be just fine. I tried not to worry too much, but in reality, I was really worried. Losing him after getting him out of harm's way so many times before was not an option in my mind. How could we have overcome so much only for him to succumb to his disease? Zachary and I talked constantly when he felt like it, and even though he was scared and alone, he said he felt like a million bucks knowing I was supporting him with my love no matter where I was. That made me feel wonderful, being able to comfort him from so far away, and for a couple weeks my comfort seemed to be doing the trick until one day that day my boyfriend died suddenly on february 14th 2008 his lungs filled with fluid he suffocated and died there was nothing anyone could do i was completely and totally lost josie broke the news and i collapsed into the biggest mess you've ever seen in your life she was still living with me at the time so she tried to console me as best as she could while she was shedding her own tears at the loss of her best friend. That forever ruined Valentine's Day for me. To this day, it only reminds me of loss and death. You don't realize how fragile your heart truly is until you've experienced a loss like that. Little did I know that even worse moments in my life were about to occur a month later. I was heading on a course for total destruction and still blissfully unaware of the one person who had been driving this crazy train from day one. Skip forward to March. St. Patrick's Day to be exact, a little over a month since Zachary had passed away. Josie had forcefully been returned to Maryland by her parents, seeing as how she had practically ran away. I was off in a la-la land of booze, drugs, and more pain than either of those could cover up. I was chilling with my Satanist posse, doing what all normal American teenagers do on St. Patty's Day, pretending like we're Irish and testing the limits of alcohol poisoning. My alcohol tolerance back then was ridiculously high, so I had already drank an inordinate amount when my phone rang. It was Josie. I slurred my words as something to the effect of, Hey girl, what you doing? Came bumbling out of my mouth. I announced to the dorm it was Josie, to which everyone replied, Hey. She had lived with us for several months, and lover or hater, she'd become an honorary southerner. The next words out of her mouth once again sent my head spinning off into space and my world into complete chaos. Zachary's not dead. I stopped breathing for a moment, and when I caught my breath, I asked her to repeat that again. She did, except this time she added the fact that his life had been in danger, blah, blah, so she had to hide even from me, blah, blah. Jacob just had to think he was dead, blah, blah. I could literally feel my brain dripping out from my ears as my mind turned into mush with every word out of her mouth. Then for the real kicker to my drunken mental meltdown, Zachary got on the phone. Sure enough, it was his voice. He apologized for what he had to do. I apologized for what I was about to do, which was scream and yell my lungs out, throw my phone into a wall smashing it into a million pieces, and then proceed to go from being super hammered drunk to completely wasted. I drank everything that wasn't nailed down. Who knows what other drugs I did on top of that because I sure don't remember. 
I was literally having a complete and total mental breakdown. The last strand of sanity in my brain just snapped. I did this for a couple more hours until I somehow drove back home, put on my work clothes, and tore out of the parking lot to go to my job in a city half an hour down the interstate, with people chasing me trying to stop me. I don't recall any of what happened next, but apparently this is what I did. I showed up to work completely wasted and got fired from a good job. I called my father freaking out in the parking lot of said job. He realized I was drunk and told me to stay there and he would come get me. Oh, how I wish crazy drunk me would have just listened. Instead of doing that, I started driving on the interstate again, not caring if I lived or died, and obviously not caring about anyone else. According to the police report, I was tearing down the interstate at 130 miles per hour. I apparently hit two mile markers on the side of the road and blew both of my right hand tires, but continued on driving with sparks shooting out 50 feet out of the back of my car. I took the exit to the hospital going that fast and spun out and completely totaled what was left in my car. According to bystanders, I then proceeded to exit my vehicle and run across the interstate towards the hospital with people chasing after me. Once I got to the ER doors, I heard the now familiar whoop whoop of a police cruiser. I was so arrested for driving under the influence. I blew a .20 about 12 hours after I had my last drink. If I had blown a .21, I would have gotten a felony charge. That led to years of failed drug tests, violated probations, and ultimately a year in jail down the line. After that, I decided enough was enough. These crazy people from Maryland and their insane concept of living could go to hell as far as I was concerned. It had been nearly two years of torment, fear, and unimaginable pain. Worst of all, it was starting to cost me my mind and my freedom. I was done listening to Josie and ready to start listening to my actual friends in town who had been begging me to stay away from those people for a long time now. Some good friends set me down and started to tell me the inconsistencies in all of their stories over the last few years. At first, I didn't want to listen, but then eventually there was too much evidence not to listen. Finally, I opened my ears and my mind to what was really going on. I decided to figure this out once and for all. I got on MySpace, Facebook, and every other social media I could think of. I typed in Josie's full name into the search bar of every single one. What I found to this day still makes me want to turn my stomach contents inside out. There, on every social media possible, by using her name and the few email addresses I knew she had, I found dozens and dozens of accounts linked to her emails. Duplicate after duplicate of Zachary's full name on accounts with pictures of her, and the same thing with Jacob, and every single solitary other person in the supposed elites. That's when it finally, after years of denial and torment, it finally freaking hit me like a railroad car full of bricks. Holy crap, she's every single one of these people. She absolutely and unequivocally made up every single solitary one of these people and has been pretending to be a dozen or more people for over two years. As you can imagine, my jaw hit the floor. Thank God I had some close friends there who kept me from falling apart and helped me find every single fake profile she had ever created. I was dumbfounded. Profile after profile after profile that had her pictures but the names of people I thought were entirely real prototype accounts before she ended up making the actual fake accounts gag or jokes to her really in fact all of this had to be one big insane psychotic joke i was too shocked to be enraged yet but don't worry that's coming i diligently copied every link to every one of her profiles into my aol instant messenger then i called her hey how are you i'm all right i guess just bored you nope Definitely not bored over here. Get on AIM chat and I'll show you something really interesting. I was nearly hysterical at that point, and I could tell she knew something was up. Once she was online, I simply asked her, Hey Josie, what are these? Then sent her the link to every single fake profile she had ever created in her miserable life. And a few from email accounts I didn't even know belonged to her. The silence on the other end of the line was deafening as I heard her clicking through link after link. Her two year long mental game was over and she finally realized it. Her words, well F man, guess you got me. She then started to laugh 
genuinely laugh as though something remotely funny had just occurred. I don't recall what I said, but apparently it was bad enough for my friends to take away the phone and have to hold me down. Catfish the show or movie wasn't around way back then, so I had unwittingly became one of the first hardcore victims of a stalker in the internet age. Worse than that, I had talked to, lived with, and even befriended the girl who had been stalking and trying to ruin my life for over two years. It was literally, and still is, the single biggest mind F I had ever had in my entire life. Thousands upon thousands of messenger conversations, hundreds and hundreds of hours of phone conversation, countless amounts of cash being spent to drive up several states away just to stay with my psycho stalker every time, even bringing her down to live with me for months, having $5,000 mysteriously vanish out of my bank account. Everything was starting to make sense. There was no Jacob. There was no Zachary. There was no gang. What there actually was, was one completely bat crap crazy insane girl with more mental problems than could fit in an encyclopedia. She was the only person I ever talked to. She was the only person I ever truly saw. And even worse, she was the one that paid Sean to come down to my house with a gun and try to kill my entire family. Josie was the only person in these last two years that had orchestrated any of this. From all the fake kidnappings and boyfriend drama, to faking the death of someone I had fallen in love with and bringing him back just to screw with my head. Who the hell does that? All the events of the last two years came flooding into my mind as I realized in each and every one, it was solely her and no one else but her. So many questions raced through my head. The least of all being why me. I deleted my space and made my Facebook account private. I only kept friends that I knew were real. I fell completely off the wagon and out of my head. Drugs, alcohol, and more drugs. That's all I could do to cope. Here I was, a gay man that had unknowingly fallen in love with a straight woman. And regardless of whether or not I thought it was a gay man, which I wholeheartedly did, that stuff still messes you up in the head pretty bad. I didn't think I could ever be close to someone again. My world had been rocked and ruined. To this day, all these years later, I still do not trust people. I don't think I will ever be able to trust someone ever again. Can you blame me? She came down here. Yeah, you heard me right. That chick moved into my sister town not even half an hour away from me. I bumped into her by accident and we started talking. Again. As much as I wanted to stomp her in a bloody pulp on the ground, you catch more flies with honey. I wanted answers. Hell, I deserved answers. I told her I was just trying to forgive her, and I needed answers to my questions in order to do so. I asked her if she would sit down with me and tell me everything, and she reluctantly agreed. I politely informed her that this forgiveness was not for her, but it was for me so I could stop holding on to and living in the past. I explained she nearly killed me and ruined my life, and what she did was the most personal and horrific thing one human being can do to another, especially after I was so good to her. She was polite and let me get what I needed to get off my chest. I tried to be calm and not rude so she wouldn't run away, and I did get closure somewhat and answers to anything. Here is her explanation. Take it with a grain of salt. It started out as a joke when she was in high school. There was a girl who was being mean to her and bullying her, so she thought she'd get back at her by getting her to like a guy online and reveal the awful truth later. Ha ha. She had made a bunch of prototype profiles, and eventually almost 20 profiles in total, so it looked like this group of people had the same friends and they were real. She just pulled pictures off of freaking Google. She knew none of these people in real life. She was having a good old time tricking this girl. When along comes a spider to mess up her web. Me. She said she thought she would just mess with me a bit and let me know she was actually a girl. But after talking to me, she unintentionally fell in love with me. Whether that's true or not, I don't know what to believe. If she really did love me, then why put me through all of this pure freaking hell for two years? She said that she wanted to tell me a million times, but it just got out of control and before she knew it, she was really getting into being these people, and somewhat believed she was them and they were real. Again, 
This chick is the world's best BSer I've ever met, so who knows what the truth really is. All I wanted to know was how did she get the music, and how did she sound like a guy on the phone? The music, as she shockingly demonstrated to me, was actually hers. She's an amazing pianist and guitar player. I saw this with my own eyes and heard it with my own ears. Zachary's voice on the phone wasn't very complicated. She paid a guy friend a few bucks to be in on it, which this jerk-off eagerly agreed to. Ruining someone's life for a few bucks? How sweet. Sean was all her. She paid him 500 bucks to do that. And she had zero explanation as to why. She knew he would do it. He's just as much a psycho as she is. The rest of it was pure fantasy and imagination. All thought up to be extra crazy so I would care more about Zachary and give her more attention. As lie after lie was finally revealed and the truth brought to life, I had heard enough after around eight hours of this. I had heard everything I really ever needed to hear and wanted to do. My life was nearly destroyed. My family nearly killed. My mental and emotional health left scarred forever and ever, simply because she wasn't getting enough attention in her life. Neither was I when all that started, but I didn't go about like a human wrecking ball trying to make myself feel better. I'll never be able to comprehend or understand the mind of someone like that. People who derive pleasure from other people's pain and misery. I'll never be able to fully trust. Not in the way that's required of a true partner and companion. I just can't do that again. If I'm mortally betrayed again, I know the next time will kill me. So as I write this in my apartment, a little over a decade after it all happened, I'm alone. One good thing did come from this. It sure as hell made me the person I am today and it strengthened and toughened my resolve into tempered steel. I learned to be okay with myself, and to finally love myself after so many years of self-loathing. I'm a pretty amazing person. I don't need a man to define my life and who I am in any shape, form, or fashion. Obviously, I'm worth something. Otherwise, this psycho chick wouldn't have latched onto me for years and ended up moving eight hours away from her home to be 30 minutes away from me all this time. What she stole, I will never get back. But what I gained, she can never take away from me again. This is a story that happened in college. During my final year in college, I was living in a two-bedroom on-campus apartment with four other girls. My actual roommate, Christine, is a sweetheart, and we're still like sisters even now, after over ten years of friendship. That was our third year rooming together, and we even signed up for the same summer abroad programs. We like to joke that we've used up all of our roommate luck by finding each other, because all of our sweet-slash-apartment mates were interesting. The rest don't warrant individual stories on their own, so I'll just type it up in the comments. The other two girls sharing our apartment was Chelsea and Brittany. Chelsea was normal, but Brittany was problematic. She would always bring different guys home every night, which was fine, except for the fact that she was in a relationship with a cop who carried a gun everywhere with him and had serious anger and jealousy issues. Oh, and she would passionate hug all over every surface of the apartment. The night this incident happened, there was a St. Patrick's Day party with free concerts happening in the school, so there were loads of people on campus. Brittany and Chelsea have gone off to party, but Christine and I decided to stay home to binge on Friends reruns because we're just so cool. In the middle of our Friends binge session, we heard someone hammering at our door. Hey, can you let me in? I need to borrow your phone. It was a male voice. We immediately assumed it was one of Brittany's guys. Sometimes they would make up stories just to get into our apartment, then refuse to leave until she comes back so they can hook up slash get into shouting matches, usually cheating related. What should we do? Christine whispered to me. I knew what she wanted, but she was way too nice to say it, so I said it for her. Let's pretend we're not in and not answer. We were in no mood to entertain a guy for hours while we waited for Brittany to get back. The guy banged on our door and asked to borrow our phone several times, but eventually gave up and left. We had fun watching the rest of the episode. When our phones buzzed, 
we both checked our phones, and it was an automatically generated campus-wide alert text. There was a stabbing on campus. It was in our very apartment complex, and happened in the unit right above ours. The stabber was an unidentified male, and he was still on the loose. I looked at Christy and asked her, Uh, could it be... She looked unsure, but went, Nah, it couldn't. Yeah, it, it couldn't. We made sure we barricaded the door to our room before we slept, though, in case Brittany brought Mr. Stabby home. I mean, she doesn't have the best taste in men. The next day, we read the school paper to find out more about the incident. Apparently, the guy knocked on the victim's door, asking to borrow her phone. She let her in, and as soon as he was inside her apartment, he grabbed the knife from the kitchen countertop and stabbed her multiple times in the stomach. She was a complete stranger, and it seems that his only motivation is to stab someone. Since the campus was filled with thousands of people during the party, the guy easily slipped into the crowd and disappeared. Our apartment was on the ground floor and right next to the stairs. If someone was to go knocking on every apartment, our apartment was most likely right before the victim's apartment. Christine and I definitely spent a few minutes shouting, holy crap, holy crap, oh my god, holy crap. Turned out, having a crappy apartment may, may have saved us. Yes, there was an article about it in the news. Here's a detail that isn't in that article. The apartment was Levy 6. If you were a fellow lion during the time, you'd remember that it was a month after there was a shooting over a high school basketball game hosted on campus. Fortunately for me, I was graduating in two months, so my mom couldn't pull me out of LA and make me move back to Indonesia ASAP. Yes, my mom received the alert too, knew our apartment's layout, and so she also pieced everything together and realized that it could have been me or Christine. First time posting here. So this happened when I was 12. I'm a 21-year-old female now. My mom had just finished photography school, so she was giving her first photo expo in a bar in the most centric part of my town, kind of far from where I lived then. So it was also my first night out in a bar. The thing was, my mom did not realize that it was also St. Patrick's Day, so the place was packed with drunk 20-year-olds. I knew I was going to get bored, so I brought my then best friend along with me, so at like 1 a.m. we were drinking coke in the bar, part of the complex, when three guys approached us. They were talking to us, making trivial conversation, nothing weird. Innocent little girls, thought they were just being nice. Then, they started asking questions. What were we drinking? How old were we? Our names and where we lived? We told them that we were both 12 and they got excited. So they started complimenting us, saying we looked older, 21 at least. We didn't. We looked 15 at most, telling us we had woman bodies and were pretty for our age, and insisting on buying us drinks and taking us dancing. There was a dancing floor on the upper level. At the moment, I remember feeling flattered but also scared and anxious. I had had my first kiss like a month ago, so the idea of dancing with someone older than me made me anxious. My friend wanted to go with them. I got close to her and whispered that they were making me nervous. That's when I noticed my dad looking our way. When we got to him, he asked us who those guys were, and I just told him they asked us if the seats were taken, because I thought he would get mad to me about being flirty with them. The night went on, and at approximately 3 a.m., my friend and I went out to hang out in the car, because it was so much quieter there. As we got in the car, we heard two guys fighting. One of them was the same guy who was talking to me. I'll call him the pervert. Don't know who the other two were. The other guy takes out a bottle and breaks it into the pervert's head, knocking him to the ground. There was blood everywhere, and the guy was on the floor bleeding, but not dead. The police came, got him up, and arrested the two of them. When finally my parents got in the car with us, they told us that the pervert had been insisting and touching the other guy's girlfriend against her will. We went home and knew no more of those guys.
It was St. Patrick's Day of 2011, and I'd just gone out for a beer and wings at a local pub with some friends. I didn't feel like staying out too late because I had a class early in the morning the following day. I had maybe two or three bottles of beer over the course of the night, and was mildly buzzed but nowhere near drunk. Because everyone else planned to stay out much later than me, I walked home alone around midnight, which wasn't a huge deal because I only lived about five minutes away. At the time, I was living in a small basement apartment in a quiet residential neighborhood. I went into my bedroom, which had a small window near the ceiling that faced the backyard. Outside of the window, the ground was dug out and there were some large items belonging to the backyard pool, which was out of service for the winter, stacked around the brick wall. I turned on the light in my room and started to get changed. I was completely naked and facing towards the window. I glanced up and saw what I thought to be the reflection of my face in the window. I glanced away thinking nothing of it at first, but then I felt like something really wasn't right. I looked up again and take a closer look at the face in the window. My eyes widened and I tried to awaken slightly from the alcohol buzz. I looked closer and realized that the face was moving around in a way that did not mirror my own movements. Also, the face was smiling and speaking. I realized there was a young man who must have literally trespassed into the backyard, maneuvered himself behind all of the pool supplies, and crouched down in the dugout area outside of the window. I freaked out and promptly grabbed a blanket to cover myself, and then ran into the living room. I was home alone, so I called one of my roommates, who attempted to convince me that I must have been imagining it because I was drunk. I'm not sure what was worse, seeing what I saw or not being believed about it. The other crappy part is that the next day when I told my classmates, they laughed at me and were high-fiving each other and being like, bro, that's hilarious. Scary and awful. Thank you so much for listening to the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. And I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. I hope you get a restful night's sleep. Good night, everybody.